There was once a king's son who was no longer content to stay at home in his father's house. And as he had no fear of anything, he thought, I will go forth into the wide world. There the time will not seem long to me, and I shall see wonders enough. So he took leave of his parents and went forth and on and on from morning till night. And whichever way his path led, it was the same to him. It came to pass that he got to the house of a giant. And as he, and as he was so tired, he sat down by the door and rested. And... As he let his eyes roam here and there, he saw the giant's playthings lying in the yard. There was a couple of enormous balls and nine pins as tall as a man. After a while, he had a fancy to set the pins up and then rolled the balls at them and screamed and cried out when the nine pins fell and had a merry time of it. The giant heard the noise, stretched his head out of the window, and saw a man who was not taller than other men, and yet played with his nine pins. Little worm, cried he, why art thou playing with my balls? Who gave thee strength to do it? The king's son looked up, saw the giant, and said, Oh, thou, oh, thou blockhead, thou, thou thinkest indeed that thou only hast strong arms? I can do everything I, I want to do. The giant came down and watched the bowling with great admiration and said, Child of man, if thou art one of that kind, Go and bring me an apple of the tree of life. What dost thou want with it? said the king's son. I do want the apple for myself, answered the giant. So I do not want the apple for myself, answered the giant. But I have a betrothed bride who wishes for it. I have travelled far about the world and cannot find the tree. I will soon find it, said the king's son. And I do not know what it is to prevent me from get what is to prevent me from getting the apple down. The giant said, "Thou really believest it to be easy? The garden in which the tree stands is surrounded by an iron railing in front of." The railing lie wild beasts, each close to the other, and they keep watch and let no man go in. They will be sure to let me in, said the king's son. Yes, but even if thou dost get into the garden and seest the apple hanging to the tree, it is still not thine. A, a ring hangs in front of it through which anyone who wants to reach the apple and break it off must put his hand. And no one has yet had the luck to do it. That luck will be mine, said the king's son. Then he took leave of the giant and went forth over mountain and valley and through plains and forests until at length he came to the wondrous garden. The beast lay around it but they put their heads down and were asleep. Moreover, they did not awake when he went up to them and stepped over them, climbed the fence and got safely into the garden. There, in the very middle of it, stood the tree of life. And the red apples were shining upon the branches. He climbed up the trunk to the top. And as he were about to reach out for an apple, 
he saw the ring hanging before it. He thrust his hand through it without any difficulty and gathered the apple. The ring closed tightly on his arm. All at once he felt a prodigious strength flowing through his veins. When he had come down again from the tree with the apple, he would not climb over the fence but grasped the great grape and had no need to shake it more than once before it sprang open with a loud crash. Then he went out and the lion which it which had been lying down before was awake and sprang after him not in rage and fierceness but following him humbly as his master. The king's son took the giant the apple he had promised him and, and said seest thou I have brought it without difficulty. The giant was glad that his desire had been so soon satisfied hastened to his bride and gave her the apple for which she had wished. She was a beautiful and wise maiden and as she did not see the ring on his arm, she said, I shall never believe that thou hast brought the apple until I see the ring on thine arm. The giant said, I have nothing to do but go home and fetch it, and thought it would be easy to take away by force from the weak man what he would give, what he would not give of his own free will. He therefore demanded the ring from the arm of the king's son. No, from 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 him, but the king's son refused it. Where the apple is, the ring must be also, said the giant. If thou wilt not give it to uh, give it of thine own accord, thou must fight me for it. They wrestled with each other for a long time, but the giant could not get the better of the king's son, who was strengthened by the magical power of the ring. Then the giant thought of a stratagem and said, I have got warm with fighting and so hast thou. He will bathe in the river and cool our, we will bathe in the river and cool ourselves before we begin again. The king's son, who knew nothing of falsehood, went with him to the water and pulled off with his clothes the ring also from his arm and sprang into the river. The giant instantly snatched the ring and ran away with it, but the lion, which had observed the theft, pursued the giant, tore the ring out of his hand and brought it back to his master. Then the giant placed himself behind an oak tree, and while the king's son was busy putting his clothes on putting on his clothes again, surprised him and put both his eyes out. Now the unhappy king's son stood there and was blind and knew not how to help himself. Then the giant came back to him, took him by the hand as if he was someone who wanted to guide him and led him to the top of a high rock. There he left him standing and thought, just two steps more and he will fall down and kill himself and I can take the ring from him. But the faithful lion had not deserted his master. It held him fast by the clothes and drew him gradually back again. When the giant came and wanted to rob the dead man, he saw that his cunning had been in vain. Is there no way of destroying the weak child of man like that? Said he angrily to himself and seized the king's son and led him back again to the precise, sorry, to, 
to the precipice or to the precipice by another way but the lion which saw his evil design helped his master out of danger here also when they had got close to the edge the giant let the blind man's hand drop and he was going to leave him behind alone but the lion pursued the giant so that he was thrown down and fell dashed to pieces on the ground the faithful animal again drew his master back from the precipice and guided him to a tree by which flowed a clear brook the king's son sat down there but the lion lay down and sprinkled the water in his face with his paws scarcely had a couple of drops wetted the sockets of his eyes then he was more able to see something and remarked a little bird flying quite close by which wounded itself against the trunk of a tree on this it went down to the water and bathed itself therein and then soared upwards and swept between the trees without touching them as if it had recovered its sight again then the king's son recognized a sign from god that stopped down sorry that stooped down to the water and stooped down to the water and washed and bathed his face in it and when he arose he had his eyes once more brighter and clearer than they had ever been the king's son thanked god for this great mercy for his great mercy and traveled with his lion onwards through the world and it came to pass that he arrived before a castle which was enchanted in the getaway so in the gateway even in the gateway stood a maiden of beautiful form and fine face but she was quite black she spoke to him and said ah if thou couldst if thou couldst but deliver me from the evil spell which has thrown over which is thrown over me what shall i do said the king's son the maiden answered thou must pass three nights in the great hall of this enchanted castle but thou must let no fear enter thy heart when they are doing their worst to torment thee if thou bearest it without letting a sound escape thee i shall be free thy life they dare not take then said the king's son i have no fear with god's help i will try it so he went gaily into the castle and when it grew dark he seated himself in the large hall and waited everything was quiet however till midnight when all at once a great tumult began and out of every hole and corner came little devils they behaved as if they did as if they did not see him seated themselves in the middle of the room lighted a fire and began to gamble when one of them lost he said it is not right someone is here who does not belong to us it is his fault that i am losing wait you fellow behind the stove i am coming said another the screaming became still louder so that no one could have heard it without terror the king's son stayed sitting quite quietly and was not afraid but at last the devils jumped up from the ground and fell on him and there were so many of them he could not defend himself from them they dragged him about the floor pinched him and pricked him and uh, beat him and tormented him but no sound escaped from him towards morning they disappeared
who was so exhausted that he could scarcely move his limbs. But when day dawned, the black maiden came to him. She bore in her hand a little bottle wherein was the water of life, and wherewith she washed him. And he at once felt all pain depart and new strength flow through his veins. She said, Thou hast held out successfully for one night, but two more lie before thee. Then she went away again, and as she was going to be, as as she was going, he observed that her feet had become white. The next night the devils came and began their gambols anew. They fell on the king's son and beat him much more severely than the night before, until his body was covered with wounds. But as he bore all quietly, they were forced to leave him. And when dawn appeared, the maiden came and healed him with the water of life. And when she went away, he saw with joy that she had already become white to the tips of her fingers. And now he only had one night more to go through. But it was the worst. The hobgoblins came again. Art thou art thou there still? cried they. Thou shalt be tormented till thy breath stops. They pricked him and beat him and threw him here and there and pulled him by the arms and legs as if they wanted to tear him to pieces. But he bore everything and never uttered a cry. At last the devils vanished. But they lay, but he lay fainting there and did not stir, nor did he raise his eyes to look at the maiden who came in, sprinkled and bathed him with the water of life. But suddenly he was freed from all pain and felt fresh and healthy, as if he had awakened from sleep. And when he opened his eyes, he saw the maiden standing by him, snow white and fair as day. Rise, said she. And swung and swing thy sword three times over the stairs, and then all will be delivered. And when he had done that, the whole castle was released from enchantment, and the maiden was a rich king's daughter. The servants came and said that the table was already set in the great hall, and dinner served up. They sat down and ate and drank together. And in the evening, the wedding was solemnized with great rejoicings. And that was the king's son who feared nothing. Next time, donkey, donkey cabbages. Until then, bye.